priming your pad versus not priming your pad. It's an age old question and debate. Stay tuned, grab your popcorn because we're gonna go into all those details next. Hi, I'm Todd Cooperider with Esoteric. Welcome to a video that we've been talking about doing for quite some time now, and it is pad priming. First of all, what is pad priming? Priming is talking about taking a fresh clean pad and preloading it with product. And the theory is with the fact that it's completely covered in product, it's going to give you a better cut because everything is covered on it. Another argument that people have is if you do it on quote unquote a dry pad without priming it, you can leave some extra marring behind. And over the years doing videos here in the Esoteric channel, we've had a lot of comments and I think we're doing a paint correction about priming the pad. Why don't you prime your pads? Or, you know, I, I watched this person, they say that you have to prime the pads. In the studios at Esoteric Detail, you know, we work on a tremendous amount of cars. As you can see, we've got a full house behind us and plenty of cars that you can't see. So we're working with this stuff every single day. Also with the Elite Detailer Academy that we've been doing for 10 years now, hundreds of students from around the world, we talk about no priming of the pad. But I don't wanna bias my judgment on it. This is based off of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you do a test or an evaluation with taking the bias out of it. Because quite frankly, if you look at everything that's out there, it's all based on bias and subjectivity. Taking a look at the surface with a light and going, yeah, that looks good. That's great. There is a certain level of, of inspecting with your eyes to be able to see what you're dealing with. However, there's a lot of stuff in the paint that your eyes simply cannot see. Now we've worked with some OEM manufacturers before helping them do training in the paint departments in their factory settings. They don't go by su subjectivity. They have got very expensive meters that measure a lot of different parameters of the paint that you can never pick up uh, with your eye. So we have got something similar. Ours is a little bit less expensive than what theirs are. One of these run you about $4,000, but a DOI meter. DOI stands for distinctness of image. If you've been watching our videos for a while. You know, we've talked about the importance of it in how that it takes the subjectivity out of all evaluations. This is mathematics. This is a high level a piece of equipment that can tell us the true state of the paint. When you're dealing with things at a, a level of uh, uh, determining what works best, you simply can't do it without this. Okay, enough about this. What we're gonna do here is I've got two sections of the hood. I'm gonna do one section where we're gonna prime the pad. I've got another section that we're gonna do it with no priming. I've already gone in, done my readings, batch readings with my DOI meter to make sure both of these sides are the same. We're not starting off with one being worse than the other, which could skew the results. I'm gonna do brand new pad here. I'm gonna do brand new pad there. Out there in the field, we're not able to use brand new pads all the time, but this keeps consistency in the testing. At the end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our DOI measurements, we're gonna go back into the office and we're gonna put them in a spreadsheet and we're going to make our evaluations. So don't cheat, stay here for the rest of the video. Okay, now having said that, and both sides have been prepped uh, the same, everything's been washed, cleaned up, uh, prepped, stripped, so I know exactly what I'm dealing with. So we have the prime pad, and what we're using for our test is Jeskar Correcting Compound. That's what we use most of the time here in the shop. And on both of these sections, I'm gonna do it the exact same pressure, the exact same size of working area, the exact same amount of time. Everything is gonna be as the same as I can possibly get it. All right, and speed-wise, we're on four and a half.
That is a normal working cycle, two sets up, down, two sets left, right. <clears throat> now I'm going to put a brand new fresh pad, nothing on the surface. And I'm gonna do my normal three drops of product and do this section here. Same speed, same pressure, everything. Okay, now that I've got that finished, just looking at it here real quick, as to be expected, you see a lot more uh, a residue of the compound on the surface, which is gonna be natural because our pad is primed, it has a lot more in it. There's not much left on the side that we did no priming. So I'm gonna take my brand new towel, wipe off the surface, and then I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna come over here I'm gonna wipe it off the surface. We're gonna clean the surface up here a bit just to make sure we don't have anything hiding. And then we're gonna take a look, see what we have. It's gonna be hard to tell on camera, but my correction rate is the same. Got everything out. There's a couple of errant, heavy, heavy scratches. I saw this one up here before we started. And this one has a couple too. You probably have to go back and chase after, but I would call this a complete uh, full correction on here on both sides. So right there, from a correction perspective, there's zero difference between the prime pad and the non-prime pad. Now I can already see here that my primed pad, as I expected, has a higher level of haziness to the finish than what this size does. But our DOI meter will tell us exactly what that haze level is. So let me proceed with uh, my measurements. I'm gonna do batches of 10. You can't just do one measurement. If you've ever worked with even a uh, paint thickness gauge, you can test something and you can move over a couple of inches that's gonna give you a different reading. Same thing with a DOI meter. It's going to have uh, uh, variations to it. So we take a measure of 10, get the averages, and make our determination from there. So simply put this on, and then I'm gonna continue. Until I get 10. Now, <clears throat> ready for this side. Okay, there we go. I've got a measurement of 10 here. I've got a measurement of 10 here. I'm gonna load these up into Excel take a look at it. Oh, and before I uh, did this, I recalibrated uh, the machine just to make sure that we've got everything on an even playing field. So let's go back into the offices. Let's take a look at what our final readings were. Okay, here we are back in the office. I've had the opportunity to uh, get in here, upload all of the data. I've got two different batches uh, that I uploaded into Excel. And then I go in, I check all my averages, and I compare the two. But before we go into all the details of that, let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here. You know, one, it's just trying to get you um, good information on exactly what's gonna work best. Do you need to do something one way, or is it not necessary? Uh, now, the other variables that can come into play what kind of products you're using. You could be using a, a polisher compound that maybe it doesn't have enough cut to it and you have to load it up uh, um, on the pad. Or maybe you're not using you know, really good quality pads or maybe your techniques aren't the, the same or whatever. Uh, so all of those are gonna come into play. What kind of paint are you working on? Um, so keep that in mind as we go over the numbers here and I'll give some final thoughts uh, as well. So let's go straight into the numbers here. I wanna take you here on to my screen and kind of show you a little bit about what we're doing. You know, here this data shows uh, the batches, the dates, 
the time, so on and so forth. But these columns that I have highlighted, you get two different measurements of gloss, your haze level, which is really important, distinctness of image, R-spec, which is specular reflection, and reflective image quality. A couple of the ones in particular that we want to pay a lot of attention to here is your R-spec because that indicates level of clarity. Now these numbers are going to show a little bit low right now because we haven't done any finish polishing. But haze, that's going to be a big one right there because if you have a lot of haze in the finish, it's going to take a lot more effort on your finish uh, polishing. So this file here is for the primed pad. So this was the first one, the one on the left that I did. And each of these readings here, you know, you can see I added all these up and then I simply divide it by 10 to get my average you know, up here, you can see it varies quite a bit. You got a low of 68 and you got a high of 76. So if we go across, you've got all of your averages down here at the bottom. Now I'm going to come up here to my not primed pad uh, to look at these numbers. We're looking at all the same numbers. This is the final totals for my uh, pad that wasn't primed. And then here on primed, I brought over all of the values from uh, the previous measurements. And these blocks that are in green are, let's call them the winning numbers. Now, if you're only a couple percent different, I wouldn't call that statistically significant uh, because I can do three different batches and, and, and those numbers would vary just a little bit. But right off of the bat, we can see that our not prime pad uh, won one, two, three, four categories and the prime pad won one, two categories. But looking at some of these differences, I mean, 1% uh, not uh, statistically significant. 0.09% definitely not a significant 1.8. I wouldn't call that significant uh, either. But the fact that you've got, you know, four to two winning in favor for the, the pad that was not primed. Now, here's one in particular that I really want to point out and talk about. As I suspected, the haze level in it. You can see that there was a 63.5% difference in those two with the prime pad being far hazier than what the pad non-priming. So that is a big number here, and, and that's one that I really want uh, to talk about. So as we're looking at these numbers, even if they were, if it was three to three, everything was pretty much even. The argument that a lot of people have out there is you have to prime your pad. You have to load it down uh, with, with a, a product to work. Uh, or the other one, remember we talked about, if you're using a quote unquote dry pad, then you're gonna cause a lot more micro marring. Well, what this proves here is just the opposite. Your primed pad has far more micro marring than what your non-primed pad has. Uh, so that is a big difference. And, and once again, if all these were about the same, it still proves priming the pad does not make a difference over non-prime. Both of our correction rates, which is subjective, both of our correction rates were the same. And in this case, most of the measurements here off of our DOI meter shows that the not prime pad actually had better numbers than what the prime pad uh, had. So that kind of puts it all into perspective there. You know, one of my big comments to people when they ask questions about that on YouTube is, have you tried it yourself? And I know what the answer most of the time is. It's it, it, no, I haven't, but so-and-so said that I have to do it and they have a lot of followers, therefore they must know what they're talking about uh, the most. But here at Esoteric, we don't go off of theory. You know, we don't go off of doing it this way just because it's been done that way for a long time. Now, back in the day, before we had machine technology like we have now, before we had pad technology, and before we had some of the uh, 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 abrasive technology that we had now, priming did work out well but it's kind of become a moot point unless perhaps you're using a product that may not work so well and you have to use more of it. Works great for the polish and compound manufacturer because they get to sell a lot more product. But what we're talking about here too, what's a scalable solution? Now, somebody may look at this and say, well, you didn't use this method for you know, priming the pad and blah, 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 and you have to add this and you have to spray this and you have to do all, all those other things. We're detailers here. Time is valuable. Time is money. If you're a DIY person, do you really want to put in a whole bunch of extra time for a convoluted process to make something work? 
You don't have to do that. You're using good techniques, you're using good products. Right here, the math tells us that uh, you don't have to prime the pack. Now, let me bring one other uh, point up here. When we're talking about that haze level, for a lot of people, your finishing polish that you're using, chances are it doesn't have a wide range of cut to finish. Most of the time, they're up here, they're just a fine finishing pad. Now, that can't gap that big haze level right there to make it a solid two-step process. Here at Esoteric, you know, we love Sonax Perfect Finish. All these years later, we haven't found anything that has quite the range that, that it has. And it can bridge that gap and it can get rid of all that haziness. If you have a haze level of up here for a prime pad, and you have a haze level down here for a non-prime pad, the finish polishing doesn't bridge that gap. Yesterday, we did another test on the same uh, vehicle, uh, a polishing process over top, the exact same polishing process, brand new pads, whole nine yards, and measured it again. Finish polish still had a gap. Even though it was reduced significantly, we had double the amount of haze in our side that we did primed compounding versus non-prime compounding. So your finish polishing stage uh, is not gonna bridge that gap. That's why we want to get as good of a finish during our compounding stage as we possibly can get. The better your finish on your compounding stage, the better the finish is going to be on your finish polishing stage. Once again, there's gonna be a lot of variables, um, but I want you to go out there, think for yourself, give things a try, do some sections side by side, figure out which one works better. Take a look at it. Now, you're not going to be able to get the kind of measurements I get out of here, but still haze is something that you can detect uh, by eye. If you're not getting the same kind of correction rate, it could be related to pressure, which is another video that, that we're uh, going to be doing. You know, when I'm doing that compounding out there, I'm between 16 and 18 pounds of pressure, including the weight of the machine. You can check that out, take some shipping scales or something, put your machine on it, press down on it and feel what that's like. That's the kind of pressure that you want to, to be using to get these kind of results. So I'm here trying to help you out, save some time, save some effort, save some money from all of the extra product that you go through when you're priming your pad. As we saw here from our results, tests show priming does not make any difference. Matter of fact, in our test here, priming the results went down compared to non-priming. Now, if you want to learn more about our techniques, how we go about polishing, check out this next video. Uh, we go through a lot of details that breaks down what we just did out there on our Suburban. If you wanna learn more about the specific products or make a purchase of the specific products that we used here in this video, uh, check down in the description. We will have links directly into them. We appreciate you hanging out with us uh, here on the Esoteric channel. We look forward to seeing you in our next video.